Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, what role does Hawaiian language play in our state? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahialani Richardson. The Hawaiian Renaissance of the 1970s revitalized the indigenous language and spurred the state to make Hawaiian an official language along with English. More than three decades later, the number of Hawaiian language speakers continues to grow. Today, Hawaiian language is used pr pr predominantly throughout the state in everything from street signs to airport announcements, as well as classrooms from preschool through college. What role does the Hawaiian language play in our state? We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our guests. Puakea Nogelmeyer is a Hawaiian language professor at the University of Hawaii Manoa. He's also a Hoku award-winning songwriter and a kumuhula. Snowbird Bento is kumuhula for Kapahula Okalelehua and an educator at Kamehameha Schools Kapalama. Snowbird was runner-up for Miss Aloha Hula at the Merry Monarch Festival in 2001. Kalehua Krug is an assistant specialist at the University of Hawaii Manoa's College of Education. He's part of the program that prepares Hawaiians to go into their communities to become educators. Kalehua is also a composer who has written for Hi'ikua, Amy Hanaili'i Gilliam, and Kealii Raichel. And Hiapo Pereira is an associate professor of Hawaiian language and literature at the University of Hawaii Hilo. After being one of the first to receive master's and doctorate degrees in Hawaiian language, Hiapo developed courses on Hawaiian literacy analysis, advanced Hawaiian literature, and research and performance of traditional Hawaiian oratory. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Aloha. us. Aloha. 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 <coughs> Puakea, why don't I start off with you first? Has there been a resurgence of the Hawaiian language, let's say in, in the last few years? Well, I think the, the seeds that have planted for the last 30, 40 years are starting to bear new fruit mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, there's still a lot of planting to be done. But there's a new, we're on the third generation mm -hmm. of kids. So in some ways, that, that we're expanding sort of the sea of speakers. In some ways, it's shallowing down a bit. What I recognize in the, the kids that are being raised today is it's so normal for them that they don't have the sort of urgency <coughs> that their parents and their you know predecessors <laughs> did have. There was a real sense of you know people being engaged to save something that could slide away. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most of the kids today have that same flavor. And maybe that's a great thing. Maybe they shouldn't be fearful of it. It should just be normalized. And Kalehua, your children are in immersion schools. Mm -hmm. Hiapo, your children are in immersion schools Good. too. How do you think their education is different compared to some of the first early ones of 30 years ago in immersion schools? Well, I think they get to reap the benefits of experience. But I think right now, um, from the, the early stages of the educational system, I think it's now branching out into the community. So a lot of these kids, like Poke was saying, uh, they end up with Hawaiian language uh, being a lifestyle, uh, Hawaiian language, Hawaiian culture being a lifestyle. I think that's what that's what breeds that, that normalcy um, within their life. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna also say that you know in, in my home, I try to instill both that you know even though you're raised this way or you're raised speaking Hawaiian, there is still an urgency. So I try and try and uh, fi fix the two together so that there is still mm -hmm. motivation yeah. and they understand that there's still much work to do in the future. <coughs> Hiapo, how do you use Hawaiian in your home and out in the community? We only speak Hawaiian. That, that's the, the language um, that we communicate in at home. Um, in the community, that, that's how our daughters learn how to speak English. Um, our, our families, TV, Mm -hmm. Barney, mm -hmm. um, they, 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 they you know, gave them their first, um, and, and you really couldn't tell. You know, they're not so different from other children. They pick it up so fast. And so um, we, as parents, um, we really need to be on the stick to give them the, the greatest amount of, of Hawaiian that we can and, and the variety of language that we can so that, uh, as Poor Kale was mentioning, they grow up, but they grow up in a normalized way but with a, a, a broader palette 
of, of color for their language uh, yeah. use in everyday life. Has anyone ever asked you, how do your kids survive in an English-speaking world? How can they survive, let's say, once they grow up to be adults in the business world? Well, how do English-speaking <laughs> children, I mean, it's, it's the exact same thing. Um, it, it, if, if anything, it's um, a huge plus to have, to be able to look at the world through the perspective that, that your language affords you. Um, it's a huge plus for them. They, they can jump back and forth, you know, at, at any time they want to. For, for us to believe in our children, or, or maybe the opposite of that, for us to think that our children are less than and maybe can't do it if they go to Hawaiian, I think is, is horrible. Our mm -hmm. children are brilliant, and we need to believe that they're, they're brilliant. They can do anything. Snowbird, how did you become fluent in Hawaiian? Um, <clears throat> I, I guess it would start with hearing my, my tutu lady and her sisters and the family speaking in Hawaiian. And, um, you know, I, I, I was raised by my grandparents and my, my tutu lady. I, I wasn't raised with my parents. My parents worked. And so, um, you know, uh, the, the regular, right? And so I was lucky enough to hear it. So when I got to uh, Kamehameha and it came time for us to choose languages, I actually chose French because my father wanted me to do Japanese, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do what my dad wants, right? Okay, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 um, but he did say to me at that time in my life, he said, oh, you know, be careful if you take Hawaiian language. I don't want to see you, you know, at a rally somewhere getting arrested, put thrown in a paddy wagon singing, <laughs> e Hawaii e kuonen. And I just thought, oh, okay, well, it, it showed the, um, the fear. The fear of, of not fitting in if we're speaking in if we're speaking Hawaiian, mm -hmm. and so. Do you so, think that fear still exists today? Absolutely. In what way? Absolutely, I think um, for many of us who have keiki, or I have my nieces, um, it's seen them through uh, Punanaleo, and now they're at Kayapuni. Um, I think one of the number one fears most parents have is, um, will my children be college ready? And are they only good enough to be teachers? And immediately I have to like rein in what I want to say. Yeah. But um, I, I, my first language teachers are, are my kupuna. My, my great grandmother was fluent. That was her first language, and and her siblings. Mm -hmm. And so well, I'm what do you really want to say when someone asks you those questions? Will my child be college ready? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely they'll be college ready mm -hmm. because. Um, they'll be more open by being grounded in who they are as Kanaka and in their culture. They'll be more open and empowered to um, be more tolerant of others and other worldviews, other perspectives. And um, I think once they, they start latching on, they can learn any other languages they wanted to too because the brain is open to that. I also think you hit on a very good point that, um, you know, when you when you have more options, the world is a lot brighter, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and 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 by S Snowbird describing about how she was raised by her grandparents, and that's her first, you know, school is not supposed to be a drop off at seven thirty and a pick up mm -hmm. at four, and they do everything, oh, yeah. which is something that that our language will instruct us mm -hmm. on how to how to raise our children, how to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's very very important to pay attention to those lessons that were maybe formulated thousands of years ago that still have great relevance today. Kalehua, can you explain the Punanaleo system and, and what's a typical day like for a student? Um, I think, Hiapo, you think you can take the Punana? I can, I can talk about the Kayapuni experience. Okay. Maybe. And what's the difference between Punanaleo yeah, and Kayapuni? Uh, yeah. what, what is that for well, our viewers who don't know? Well, for, oh, for, the, for the Punana, the Aha Punana Leo is an organization. I, 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 well, but Punana Leo is preschool. Right, yeah. preschool. And Kula yeah. Kayapuni is yeah. anything from Malaho from K to 12. And there are charter schools too, so that, that fall on the, 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 the guys of Kayapuni. Kayapuni is full immersion, mm -hmm. and some of the charter schools are full immersion and some aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Hawaiian based, however. Right, yeah. right they'll be Hawaiian cultural based, but maybe not language uh, immersion. They'll be partial immersion. So it's a, there's a different way of, of uh, there's a different tact for, for many of these schools, but they're all trying to teach the students Hawaiian language. Mm -hmm. Right, correct, correct. And all of them attempt to do a cultural foundation right. for education as well. They've got to articulate that with the DOE strictures and sort of the, the broad mindset on what constitutes education. Mm -hmm. you know, that 
the suspicion of bilingualism is American. I mean, that's so yeah. widespread that that's, <laughs> that's a piece here. Is anybody who isn't a solo English speaker, you know, that's, are they big enough, good enough, full yeah. enough? Mm -hmm. Now, when the reality of that is, of course, it makes your brain right. stronger, mm -hmm. better, you're less likely to get Alzheimer's. Come on, learn Hawaiian. Have there been yeah. studies, that, you know, because <laughs> you always will hear parents going, will my child survive in the world? Have mm -hmm. there been studies in, you know, putting these kids side by side? 100%, they have tracked it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the Punanaleo <laughs> opened up in 1985. You know, officially, they've tracked those children. We've now got a whole generation. Mm -hmm. It's very much up to the child and the setting. It's not the language as much as it is what's being invested in that child and what that child will bring to the table. Just like in the monolingual English schools. Exactly. So mainstream yeah. schools, yep. same results. Mm -hmm. Well, Snowbird, what do you make of the fact that, you know, government is using Hawaiian language more? Uh, you hear it on our city buses mm -hmm. and you hear it in the airport. What do you make of that? I think it's a nice mm. step forward. It's a nice step forward so that um, it helps to normalize the um, people hearing Hawaiian language and not being so um, disconnected mm -hmm. from hearing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of, one of the, the most important things we have to remember um, whenever we're using Olelo Hawaii in, in a promotion or, or outside venue, that, that what we're seeing is not necessarily just a, a straight literal translation, mm -hmm. but that contextually it makes sense to the listener as well. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I also want to say too that I don't actually, I wouldn't want to attribute uh, those gains to the government. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I actually think that the airport on the buses are coming from community-based movements right. that are trying to push for these things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because uh, Pat from Kailua says, it seems to me that Hawaiian language is being pushed off on residents who can't pronounce. Street names and the Hawaiian language should not be imposed. Hiapo, what do you think about that comment? I think, um, I think you should have respect for whatever community you live in. Um, you know, let's not forget our language is the expression of our essence as a people to the world. Now, if you take that away, there are a lot of beautiful beaches worldwide. <laughs> people come yeah. here for the culture, and the culture is embedded strictly in the language. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not so much as, I, I, think, I think we need to, you know, a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, how dare we think that our children can't make it, you know? Mm -hmm. why, why do we think that it's a bad thing to, to pronounce the, the queen's name correctly? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a bad thing, it shows mm -hmm. respect. I, I would actually like to add to the imposition part because Article 15 of our state constitution right. recognizes English and Hawaiian as two, the, the two, two state official languages. So yeah. the point there, and I was trying to think of a good metaphor, I mean, the state is younger than I am. Right. And so, <laughs> Not I good looking. <laughs> I Bless you. They painted me in the back. But I was trying to think of a metaphor, and it's sort of like acquiring a house, whether you bought it, sold it, rented it, or just occupied it, whatever. So the state gets this house, which is Hawaii, in 1959. And there's a mango tree there. And over time, the state, you know, the householder says, well, we honor this mango tree, but the whole yard is planted with corn. And the mango tree doesn't die off. You know, I was trying to think of a, some kind of an analogy. And the question that was just asked about that imposition sort of makes it like the corn that's planted everywhere is certainly normalized. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody's bought to. Okay. So they're losing a familiarity. And maybe they never met the mango tree, you know, but, but it's there. The mango tree, the Hawaiian language has been here for a couple of thousand years. Well, it's actually probably from 1200 A.D. So what is that? It's only about 800 since it yesterday. gelled into, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. You, many of you have used the word normalized. Mm -hmm. So how normalized do you think the Hawaiian language is, Kalehua? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's anywhere near normalized. And, I, and, and that's where I think I point back to um, looking at, going back to Article 15, is that if you actually do not just uh, fiscal audits of the state, but look at how legislation or, or policies that actually support the utilization and the, and the expression of Hawaiian as um, equitab equitably used 50-50 in, in all state functions because that's how it stands in our constitution, mm -hmm. um, then I think the language is extremely under-resourced. Well, we did a piece, you know, I was working with that roadmap, whatnot, and I ended up, I gave a speech and said, 
that really since the initiation of the, the status as an equal language, Hawaiian has been used, and this is not a critique, it's just a report. It's more decorative than functional. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hauled out, it's like those lovely mangoes, or you know, it could be a ulu tree. It's hauled out to show off at events. It, you can't open something without a Hawaiian Hello. prayer. Mm -hmm. You've got a chanter, but nobody in the room understands the chant. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a really important roadblock because if we keep it decorative, you don't sort of advocate for it normalizing. Mm -hmm. So how do you and, see, and the, you know, the decorative, is, is that, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Does that show that we're making progress or is it, does it mean that things are just staying at a standstill? It's, it's definitely a start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, you need to grow critical mass. Mm, yeah. You know, we, uh, we, you, we, we have a K through 12 site on Hawaii Island. We have a K through 12 site on Oahu here. Maui needs a K through 12 site. Kauai should have a K through 12 right. site. Our, our university programs need to be fully funded. Mm -hmm. we, we're talking about, you know, once again, Hawaii can lead the nation as the only state that has two official languages. Mm -hmm. you, you really need to get back to the, the, the foundation of existence and, and, and add to put meat to mm -hmm. the critical mass. What's the biggest challenge, let's say, for Hawaiian immersion, Kalehua? Um, mm. right, right now, I think it's going back to the, the, uh, the, the philosophical, the, or the lack of philosophical support by government agencies. So this is actually the responsibility of the Department of Education. And if you look at how much money has been appropriated for, for those schools, and not just for the schools, it's for, for the, the anticipated growth of a program to get to a point of parity and um, equitability maybe, that it actually looks like the percentage that, that, that both official languages are, are being given the, 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 the same um, nod, the, the same concern. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between minimal compliance, because yeah. you, know, you have to, and the notion of being fostering something. It's, you mentioned something about having. We have two languages. It's like having two children and feeding one. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, you don't want the other one to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, to actually not only to treat them equally, but to want them to yeah, both flourish. Right. I want the English schools to be excellent here. It, I'll pay more taxes, I'll double it. You know, you can put that on television. <laughs> if they would make my, the education system excel. Yeah. But I want that to happen for the Hawaiian language kids too, because that's a piece of what we're trying to do in Hawaii. Snowbird, how did you become interested in Oli or chant, and what is your main goal when you are teaching hula and chant to your students? That's a great question. I think it's because I, I experienced, I was around people who chanted um, growing up. My uncle was an entertainer. And so I was um, introduced to the likes of, you know, Auntie Lena Alakalamahaini, whose chanting voice is just superb. Mm -hmm. And got to listen to them and hear it. And it was something in my na'au, it just kind of pulls on you. And so I remember um, my first Founders Day and listening to the chanter go across the, the, mm -hmm. the gym and thinking in my head at seventh grade, when I'm a senior, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And when I was a mm -hmm. senior, that was. Yeah. That's what I ended up doing. That was my kulana. And so it, it, it keys into me being a kumuhula. And, and what I'm trying to get across to my, my haumana is that um, oli is, I think it's, I might have said it earlier, oli and hula, they're like the PowerPoint of our kupuna. Mm. This is the mm. ancestral roadmap to us being able to navigate for ourselves now. Today. Mm -hmm. Not just in you know, vakahiko, but for ourselves now, which also leads then to the idea that Hawaiian language is very important to the survival of hula because we need to also be composing for our time right now mm -hmm. so that our keiki can have that and, and the future generations will know about us mm -hmm. and the work that we've done. We have a question from Mel from Honolulu and this is for Puakea. Everyone on the panel is Hawaiian except for Puakea Nogumeyer. What is his Shocking. ethnicity and his real name? <laughs> <laughs> my real name is Puakea, <laughs> right. which was Mikey Ayu's name and she gave it to me and you know that was, that couldn't get more real. Mm. My legal name is Marvin. Now, Marvin. and you might know, I came here as an 18-year-old mm -hmm. and kind of fell into language. And when we talk about, you know, more decorative than functional and 
Well, what's that? It's actually fun to be part of the decoration. What, what was it about <laughs> Hawaiian language and culture that captured you? It was actually, it was accident, sort of. I got involved, it was hula was enjoying a renaissance before language was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hula was much more widespread, so I got involved in hula, and that's where I got, I didn't even know Hawaii had its own language. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I was an empty umeke, you know, and started to be interested in language. So I wasn't an academic at the time, mm -hmm. so I learned it out in the community. I worked with old folks and wanted to learn. Do you ever feel skepticism because you are not native Hawaiian? Oh, this is, it's a huge topic here. The same, with, <laughs> <laughs> not so much at this table, but no, I mean it is, it's always questionable, how can I know anything if I'm not Hawaiian? Well, I don't think that knowledge is genetic necessarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it has to do with investment. And actually, I get a lot of Hawaiians who come up and like say, ah, oh, you make me feel bad because I don't speak my own language, you do. I, you know what, I'm half German and I don't speak a word of it, and I don't feel bad about it. But that's got a, an emotional impact here. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with history as much as anything, mm -hmm. history and location, because of what's happened with Hawaiian language and with Hawaiian things. Mm -hmm. That carries a lot of weight. Let's go back to our schools, and is there a movement to have the Hawaiian language be a requirement in our Hawaii schools right now, Kalehua? Um, yeah, there have, there's been a few um, um, bills that have run through the legislature in the past three to five years, I think, um, and maybe even more than that. Uh, but I think right now uh, there's actually two policy redrafts uh, at the Board of Education that are coming up on February 18th, and one of them deals with um, the actual addressing of Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language for all 180,000 students, and it's 2104. <coughs> what about the university system, Hiapo? When someone enters college, it, are they required to take any type of Hawaiian language? No. You're, you're, I, I believe you're required. I don't even know if there's a... Even, they've right. broken the language right. requirement for the okay. undergraduate so you, degrees. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, no. That used to be a regular requirement. You had to have two years of a foreign language right, correct. because of what it did for thought processes. Mm -hmm. Any language would do. They have <laughs> broken that down to probably only a quarter of the degrees require that, mm -hmm. which has really changed the enrollment in language, whatnot. But even the ones for the schools, are they making it mandatory for students or mandatory for schools to offer? Well, right, right now, I think in the policy redraft, it's just saying that it's to be included. How it's going to be included, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. right, 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 the, right. the implementation of that policy is what's mm -hmm. going to come next. Because most of the places that are trying to do language revitalization, the idea of forcing kids to learn it is the best way to kill it. Yep. Earl from Eva Beach says, much has been said about what is available for our keiki. What is available for seniors? Snowbird, can you answer that question? Well, um, I know that there's some online uh, classes that are available. Yeah, there's hello, also... Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, there's, you know, programs that are in the communities now that are offering um, Olelo Hawaii classes, community um, colleges, mm -hmm. um, extension you know, adult education. My, my mother mm -hmm. went and took some adult education classes in the community. Mm -hmm so that she could learn Hawaiian too. And speaking more of education, you know, you have parents who send their kids to, let's say, Chinese school, after school, yeah. there's Korean school, uh, Japanese school. Is there anything where, uh, available for parents who say they, they want to send their kids to some sort of Hawaiian language class, but they don't necessarily want to have them mm. fully immersed? You know, there's really not anything in place. Yeah. There's some programs, halau, mm -hmm. yeah. some of the halau Why not? Have language how, how come sites? that's not around? <coughs> no, just, the little circle that's doing the revitalization yeah. is, so is pretty spread thin. Right. Yeah. How, how many so, people are we talking about? Well, what is One, it, 20? <laughs> 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 really, you're talking the group of teachers and, and at least fluent enough to be able to operate to set up something like that. You're really only talking a couple of hundred people mm -hmm. throughout the state wow. that are at a level that could generate and operate something like that. How so. many people do you think are, are fluent in Hawaiian or at least proficient in Hawaiian? The numbers are always iffy. Sure. I've been using 20,000, but I use a low level of fluency. Only because, I mean, people can understand and follow. If, if they can, you know, be able to follow what's happening here, uh, in, if we had a conversation, that's a level of fluency that I think there's probably 20,000. In the course of 30 years of courses mm -hmm. up at UH, mm -hmm. Punanaleo kids that come out and they may not keep up the language, but they've got it. Um, 
them with the people that really delve into it and hold on to it. I think that number is pretty real. And, and I guess, you know, Porky, I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned earlier and uh, regarding your question. You know, the teachers that we have in place now, they really, really deserve all the credit. Um, you asked a question before about the difference between a, an immersion school and an English school. You know, in an English school, you can go to the store and have your pick of lesson <laughs> plans and textbooks and, and you know, we are, our teachers are creating and teaching simultaneously at the same time. So they're doing double, triple work. So why don't we have programs in place? Well, lack of support, <laughs> but the people that we do have, the, the diehards that will take it to the grave, a very small number and, and, and we need to really support them. Where does the Hawaiian anyway. language stand in terms of being a, a language of business and deal making? We, we talk about scholarship, we talk about learning, education, higher learning, but what about uh, you know actually being something where people can make money from it or, or have an, a thriving economy? Well I think, I think a, a great mm. thing to look at to create critical mass is the media. Now, you, you know, you have uh, OEV TV in place that uh, they, they provide uh, programs all in Hawaiian um, and, and radio stations. I know there's one on here in Oahu, there's one in, in Hilo. But you have to look at, at the long-term effect as far as helping and aiding to create this critical mass. Mm -hmm. Now, now you, you put it into the schools, but actually the schools should be the vehicle to then put it in the home, and oh, which is yeah. what you talked about earlier, we're of the third course, generation. Yeah. So and when it's put into the home is mm -hmm. where you have the grip on life. And, and, this, and this to me, economy, real quick, because I think it, it points back to that, the, mm -hmm. the disparity of, of philosophy. That if, if, right. if the government, if the, the, the <coughs> mainstream business mindset, mainstream educational mindset thinks that these kids, we're doing a disservice to the, the children, the language will not grow. Mm -hmm. it, it, that is the gate that we cannot pass. It's a mm -hmm. philosophical barrier. Right. Pat but from also, Kula said, the prior caller said that Hawaiian language is being imposed. It isn't okay. Hawaiian, it isn't Hawaiian the language of the land. The Hawaiian language has suffered due to Western neglect of the language. Snowbird, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I mean, Hawaii, this is our home. Our, our kupuna are buried here. And when we raise our children, who are kanaka too, they need to know that because that's how we plug back in to, to our kupuna, to our connection with aina, our kuleana, our responsibility um, to, to care for that resource. And it's where all of our practices that we do, they live. Um, we cannot live without that. Our, 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 our culture is inherent in the language. Mm -hmm. And then that, therefore, our connection to kupuna our connection to our generations that will come to from you know from us, um, that's important. I, yeah. Can I, can I just put out that I mean, and that's changing culture mm -hmm. because Hawaiian business was carried on in Hawaiian mm -hmm. for the first two hundred years of business ah, yeah. here. I mean, the, all of those operations. We're not talking grass houses and hula right. skirts. We're talking about the first bank was set up in Hawaiian. That's right. So the more that it's utilized, and one of the most successful men in business here. Dwayne Steele was a f the only executor, what is CEO and owner operator, totally fluent in Hawaiian. And he always said that his awareness of the other languages helped frame some of what he did. But there's really a lot to be said on yeah. that. The, I also want to say that the fact that this program on public broadcasting right. about Hawaiian language right. is being held in English. So Puakea, tell us what you just said, because most of our audience could not understand what you just and said. And that's the point, right. is why, you know, the fact that a program on public broadcasting is being held about Hawaiian language in English, mm -hmm. you know, what would it, how many of the audience will understand if we talked in Hawaiian for a bit? It'd be a good thing. So give us a couple of minutes. I was asking, what is the real value of teaching his children Hawaiian exclusively at home? And he said to perpetuate the traditions, mm -hmm. the, the family traditions. Mm -hmm. Aye. 
Mm-hmm. Ai, mau no ka mako ole lo maka, maka papahula mena keiki. E nui na keiki i hele me ila i ka papahula, a ole na e lako e kama ili o maka ole lo Hawaii. A ka na e, no ko lako noho ana. Mau no, mau no ko lako noho ana. Lo, hiki a lako ke lohe, a ka maaina ho i lako i ka leo ole lo Hawaii. Ayala. And then hiki a lako ke puka maila. A ole makau i ka ole lo. Ai, a ole na e lako makau. Ma mua o ko mako ho o kuku ana, mena keiki, wale no, ai mako ma, ma hape o, ka, o ke kahua. Kama ili o hoi wau me, me lako, maka o lelo Hawaii wale no, e ho i kaika hoi o ko, e mālama o ko i ke la aloha no, ke ia alii no, ke ia mo o lelo a pela wale aku. A hula o ko me ke aloha no e o la hoi kako i ka o lelo Hawaii a me ko ka o ko wale no. And Silver, please translate because <laughs> our audience wants to know what is she saying? Um, just saying that um, although all my students that come to, to dance for me, they may not be Hawaii, they may not speak Hawaiian, but I still use it. I use it so that they get ma'a, they get used to hearing it, so that their ear, it's not foreign to their ears. Mm-hmm. And when the time is right, it'll puka from them. It'll, it'll come out in ways that um, they don't even understand. And, and I gave the example that right before a competition with my keiki, when I'm backstage with them, right before they're about to take the kahua, I'm speaking to them only in Hawaiian. Whether my keiki speak Hawaiian or not, Hawaiian or not, I'm speaking to them only in Hawaiian and saying to them, you know, persevere, show the, show the strength that you need to, and show your aloha for, for this ali'i or this mo'olelo that we're, we're, we're dancing for. Well, tonight we are discussing the role Hawaiian language plays in our state with guests Puakea Nogelmeyer, Snowbird Bento, Kalehua Krug, and Hiapo Pereira. We invite you to join our conversation by emailing, calling, or tweeting your questions and comments. Call 973-1000 on Oahu and 800-283-4000. 4847 from the neighbor islands. We have another question from Kauka Manao via email. Please discuss the revival of the Hawaiian languages being done primarily as a political weapon for sovereignty rather than a cultural tool for music, history, and literature. I'm just going to throw that one out. Anyone want to answer that? I just say no. Yeah. Mm. I don't think that that's true. <laughs> If, I think if it, even if it's <coughs> there, I don't know. Well, I, th- I, think mm. th- I think there's a, uh, a, a sense that what is put on media is all that's taking Correct. place. Mm. And, and I, I would actually yeah. like to clarify that political mm. sovereignty, there are many different types of sovereignty, right. many different types, of, and even not even sovereignty, but self-determination. Mm-hmm. That one thing that by raising the children in Hawaiian, um, through our culture, too. through our ways. Correct. That's a way of self-determining mm-hmm. for them. That's something that no one can take from us. Mm-hmm. Right. Snowbird, I've got a question for you. This is from Cheryl via Cover It Live. You're a musician yourself, uh, as long as a kumuhula. Mm-hmm. Do you mind if musicians sing songs in Hawaiian when they don't understand the words? Would you prefer that they not sing those songs at all? Uh, I think that's a really interesting question because the mele can be the vehicle for them to learn the language and to, to be, uh, get ma'a to it. Um, I don't think that they should not sing it, but I think that they should learn how to sing it properly. Yeah. That's then, a big deal. And invest. And, and invest the time into it, yeah. And you see, make it a Absolutely. vehicle. That's, that's well, how you, I learned Hawaiian. You won the award for really. Hawaiian language when you were competing <laughs> for Mary Monarch and Miss, Miss Aloha Hula. Uh, when you hear certain words in Hawaiian that are not used, let's say, appropriately, th- does it make you cringe? I. Um, depends on when and where. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it depends on when and where. I think um, something to just because of, you brought up the olelo and then and um, award and the chanting. I think once people start getting really uh, used to, to Hawaiian, they'll also mm-hmm. find that hula and Hawaiian. There's a few differences. What is chanted and what might be mm-hmm. um, performed might not necessarily be like uh, more of I don't want to say standard, but Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, it's different. That's how it's poetry. Every language. Look at yeah, English, it's poetry. you know, in its many fields, right? Mm-hmm. right? So. Puakea, can you uh, describe this word, or please let people know what this word means? And this is from Michael from Kahalui. What does the word haole mean? Ah, it's actually, it's an old, old word, mm-hmm. meaning foreign. Mm-hmm. Now it gets to the, I mean, folk etymology has the ha ole, yeah. which is a different word. Mm-hmm. It meant literally foreign, not from here. So that in the census, because the Hawaiian kingdom was actually a multi-racial kingdom, and when they did the census, they did not measure your color or anything. Mm-hmm. 
you know, you could be popolo, you could be, you know, black skinned, mm -hmm. and still be called haole, because you weren't a Hawaiian subject. Mm -hmm. And you could be from India, or you could be Japanese, mm -hmm. and you'd still be called haole. Oh. <laughs> so is <laughs> the word, you, you know, a lot of people think that haole is a derogatory term. Well, it gets used as a derogatory, <laughs> but so can <laughs> Hawaiian. <laughs> so can yeah. Kanaka, so can anything mm -hmm. can be used as a derogatory. It's certainly become, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, drama goes on race <laughs> these days. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's much study on, I mean, that's that's sort of an American custom, is the, the whole racial tension thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was very different dynamic during the Kingdom era and even moving into the Territory era. But, you know, that it's an unfortunate cultural mm -hmm. issue. Michael right. also wants to know, what's the definition of aloha? We only have an hour, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> 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 it's so broad, that's why. It's just, you know, I mean, you can cover some of the bases, but well, they're asking because of the, I mean, the, the alo and the ha. And ha yeah. And yeah. Let, let, me, let me put it this way, um, and, and this is my way of attacking onto a previous question. Um, let's think of aloha like this. Japanese, with all due respect, the, the language can go back to Japan. Chinese, they have their motherland in China. Mm -hmm. This is our aloha. Mm -hmm. This is it. So you, you cannot separate that from the only place that it's ever known to be. That is aloha. Aloha aina, aloha olelo, aloha lahui. Mm -hmm. Who we are. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's misuse of the word? Well, I think, um, or do you find that some people overuse it, or maybe even overuse some Hawaiian like words just to appear to be more decorative, uh, decorative or, or more Hawaiian? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, at, at least it's being used. Mm -hmm. I, I like mm -hmm. to, I like to maybe put more effort into reminding people that mahalo does not mean the trash can, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it's written on trash can. <laughs> it doesn't mean throw away your trash, yeah. or, you know. But, but hey, at least it's being used, and um, we just have to. You know, getting back to your, your previous comment about cringing when you hear someone mm. mispronounce, it just makes me um, want to work harder, yeah. you know, mm. to, to help. help. Right, to, to help. help all the right. And Probably. getting back to actually the language being a weapon, of, so, you know, and I think there's 20,000 people that invested enough to learn mm -hmm. to speak it. There's 20,000 reasons. And in learning Hawaiian, because <laughs> there's a, Hawaii is different than most of the world. And, you know, not to launch into a lecture on, but the huge body of written material here is unlike yes. anywhere else. Yes. So learning Hawaiian opens the door to that for a lot of people. And so they become politically, historically, culturally aware in ways that the general public don't. That can be seen as divisive, mm -hmm. it's not. And it's how you learn the true meaning of aloha and, and haole mm. and mahalo through mm -hmm. getting back inside to the mana of our kupuna. Let's right. talk about Kamehameha schools. Uh, Sharon via Cover It Live. What responsibility does Kamehameha Schools have in all of this? I understand KS is considering dropping cultural education and even the Hawaiian preference so they can focus on meeting Western academic standards. And full disclosure, we've got several Kamehameha grads here. One, two, three, and four. I wonder where she got the data. That's amazing. I don't understand that. Well, oh. Snowbird, you want to take a shot at that one? Well, um... Yeah, I'd like to say first that I think it's exactly the opposite of what's happening right now at Kamehameha. Kamehameha is, um, what is Kamehameha's responsibility to, to the community, to the Lahui, to Ho'omau, Ka'olelo Hawai'i? One, two, three, four, I mean, we're, we're graduates. Um, I think while we were at Kamehameha, there were kipuka perhaps, mm -hmm. where the language thrived, where being culturally based thrived, where is Kamehameha going at this point? Um, you know, as, as we've said earlier, there's only so much that can be done. I think everybody tends to look at Kamehameha um, <laughs> as the elephant in the room because they have so much financial base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But really, really, that financial base can only go as far as, as, as we can. And um, one of the key things that Kamehameha is doing at the moment is really trying to reestablish and reach out to the community base because we know that that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. We're all community people. Mm 
-hmm. Even though I work for this school or, or we graduated from this school, we're community people. We live in our communities, we work in our communities, we thrive and that's what we want. And, and I think, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I, I, I don't want to say a thousand percent because I don't know that for true, but I think 99.99 percent of all of the Hawaiian language community successes were community driven. It didn't come from a system. Yes. It was community driven and then the system later adopted it, you know, but, but after pushing the envelope, the blood, sweat and tears of parents and families and, and community members coming together to push the envelope, then it gets adopted. So, you know, I think Kamehameha has, has, a, has a role like every other institution should have oh, a role. Yeah. And getting back to what Kalihua said, every other individual should have. Mm -hmm. Speaking Absolutely. your language is sovereignty at its core. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, Pua Kea, uh, Lori from IEA wants to know, I'm not Hawaiian. How can learning and using the Hawaiian language enrich my life? You know, everybody who came here during the Kingdom era had to learn Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. it was there. Then it became, like in my time, it was a rarity, but what I would say is, Laurie, jump on it. Right. Mm -hmm. My life is, it's been a lot of work, and it's the best work I could have ever chosen. My life is richer because when I look across, I can stand at the Pali and look at the whole Windward side. And to me, it's a collection of stories and names and, mm -hmm. and resources that are right there in the place names and the history of the place and whatnot. And Laurie might have to stand there and she sees real estate. You know, I mean, there's there's other layers that open up mm -hmm. under that. They tried so to get me. So, what specifically do you think she should do? Just start to learn the language. Start to understand how to access the resources. You don't have to become fluent in the language to be able to really start to appreciate what's around you. The lady who feels a little imposed on by the place names, look up those place names. Right. There's a story about every one right. of them. Learn how to pronounce them. I was on the news, and they were asking about the right and wrong of. I said, there isn't any right. If you say Wainai and Kanioi, it's not that it's wrong, it's just not Hawaiian. So it doesn't carry the information that's in that name, unless you say Kaneohe mm -hmm. and Wainai, that carries a little different zone. And it really doesn't even matter how you spell it. I've heard people say, you know, I, I don't want to pronounce Hawaiian words correctly because I, I can't do it and I don't mm. want to pass myself off as being Hawaiian. What does that say to you, Kalihua? Uh. I seem to be pointing straight back to the philosophy. I think that mainstream American uh, perspective is monolingual, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> monotheistic. I mean, I think what comes with language is culture. I think we were talking about that earlier. That mm -hmm. I think we're talking about language separate from culture. Mm -hmm. And if we uh, understand our language, read our stories, learn what the kupuna's perspective on things are, that they had that their polytheistic foundation allowed them to allow a lot of different things into their, into their um, sites. Right. And so I think that, that um, although we're not talking about polytheism, we're talking about the philo philosophy of, of being able to see multiple, diff multiple oh. lenses from that mm -hmm. lens. The Hawaiian lens affords different perspectives, and it's all okay. Mm -hmm. Whether the monolingual lens, the monotheistic lens, the um, individualistic, mm -hmm. capitalistic American lens, mm -hmm. You know, Hongji Don, I'm this, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to exert any extra effort to be this. Yeah. I, Hiapo, you yeah. traveled to Spain and you studied uh, what's happening in, with the Catalan language mm -hmm. and, in the, and the Basque region as well. Yeah. What do you think that Native Hawaiians or the indigenous oh, language here can oh, learn from other indigenous languages? Follow suit. Follow suit. Speak your language. Speak it. I mean, really, getting over the hump, I'll be totally honest with you. My wife and I got married. We were together for, for a number of years. We got married. We were Hawaiian educators, you know, going on 20 plus years now. And for the most part, we would speak Hawaiian to each other. But when we had our children, and when they could turn around and talk back to us, mm -hmm. that was pure magic. Mm -hmm. That was pure magic. And, and I would wish that blessing on every family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every family, when your baby can turn around and say, oh, yeah. ah, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learning it and, and knowing what that is, mm -hmm. is pure magic. So to, to grow that, to grow that, the, the baby steps, that's another way. I mean, you, I don't know how, how old Lori is, but if she has children, you know, that's, that's a way that, that our young parents learn Hawaiian. They grow with their children in the program. Mm -hmm. Can I point out too, the fear of being perfect. <laughs> You know, right. I can't do it perfect. I right, can't, right. You know, that's, that's artificial. And the notion of baby steps, if you, like, I stayed in Samoa, 
my someone was probably atrocious. <laughs> And they were so encouraging because yeah, my attitude, right, I mean, right. is I w was trying to do it right. So, I mean, if you come at it with a good <laughs> engagement, and still, I've been doing Hawaiian language longer than most of them have been alive. And, I mean, I don't think that I, I make like that makes me perfect. I'm not done. I'm still a student. I'm still at it, still learning. And the notion of there's not a perfect right that you're going to learn, this insight that we talk about, it's not like you step inside, you get it. That was always layered. Mm -hmm. You will continue to you learn. You yeah, the, you mm -hmm. learn the story, you then you relearn the story, it. and there's more to it. It just mm -hmm. keeps unfolding. Yep. Like and 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 I and I, you know, on the other side of the rainbow, I think um, that we can focus on, and and maybe this is a metaphor. I'm not speaking about Christian prayer, but what I'm going to say is is that the Hawaiian style of Christian prayer. Is 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 going out the door very very fast, yeah. mm -hmm. very fast, because our our old folks are, are not around. And mm -hmm. If we if we pay attention to the language and how the language was pieced together, um, compositions mm -hmm. come out more Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speech making comes out more mm -hmm. Hawaiian. Everyday speech comes out more Hawaiian because you pay attention to the stylistics the of the nuances and the breadth of the language, rather than learning it and, and, and with the equal sign. You know, mm -hmm. I, I always tell mm -hmm. my students, Ho'omana does not equal religion. Mm -hmm. Get over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get over it. So, yeah. Yeah. What, what's the evidence to indicate the state of normalization of the Hawaiian language? We have... PBS 24-7 Hawaiian language? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One day maybe. TV. 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 You're asking all those questions you have the, there's, a, <laughs> there's a dictionary <coughs> online, Hawaiian dictionary oh, online. Oh, well, there's resources online. And I want to encourage people. There are so many resources today that weren't there right. when I was learning. Right. You know, I mean, we, we're going door to door, and now they're online. So, I mean, that's incredible. And I would encourage every, Haole, Hawaiian, anybody who lives in Hawaii, learn Hawaiian. This is a language of the land. Be there. And actually, to give props to that, I, I want to say, as, as yesterday as 2002, when I finished my thesis, I was, I, I think we we're part of the last generation that you have to sit in the library and do this with the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Now, all of our students can blah, 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 and they have so it right at much. home. You know, they have, awesome. it, it, just as, as, as yesterday as 2002, I, you know, I didn't have Ulukau and, and, and everything oh, on the, in, online, so, a blessing, a huge yes. blessing. So much of it. Right. So I wanted to talk right. a little bit more about your own children. And Kalehua, you have a daughter. Mm -hmm. And how has she embraced the Hawaiian language? Uh, well, I have two daughters. And I, um, my oldest versus my youngest. Um, what are their ages? Uh, well, my oldest is 13. My youngest is 8. And, uh, and it's uh, the, the way that they interact with language where I think my oldest um, her, her Hawaiian is meticulous because mm -hmm. that we, we sheltered her, you know, and that's pointing more back to that, that, that sign of normalcy. I'll be honest with you, in my life, there's a lot of signs around, around me that I can go day after day and not have to speak too much English uh, within the home and with, at, at work because there are um, people with those capabilities. But I think for my children, it's building that that. Um, pseudo normal environment for them too that I think that mm -hmm. our schools afford and some of our, our, our cultural practices afford mm -hmm. that where that raising her in that bubble the grammatical bu bubble mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. and now my youngest daughter having not really having to learn Hawaiian from me having to learn with the, the, the others that her, their Hawaiian her my youngest Hawaiian is so much more rich I think it's so much more uh, real to her and, it's, and I'm not saying that there's levels of real. I mean, it's hard to de describe that. But for her, the way it comes out, the way her English comes out, you can hear that yeah. her English grammar is structured. She knows they, they all dance for snow, but her mm -hmm. English grammar comes out very Hawaiian yeah. when she's speaking mm -hmm. English at that age. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, the other two uh, were similar to that, but I think that um, over time, it's getting normal to be a part of their mind. Mm -hmm. the way they so for your younger one, it, the Hawaiian language is more natural? Is that what um, you're trying to well, say? Well, it's natural for all three of them because yeah. they, we, don't speak, we don't speak English to each other. Um, I think it's more the, the technique or the method that I use because I, I approached it, you know, at first, the first drought, we're going, we're doing this. <laughs> kind of, not on a say, you know? And then you the, the, sec the second one comes, <laughs> and, the second one comes and daddy's more tired. <laughs> And the third one comes around the roof. Okay, uh, Tita, go take yeah, care yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You jump on that. Yeah. 
you know, <laughs> his youngest, she has two other role models for her. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That is what changes, I think, the the innateness mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She has two older ones who have already gone yeah. through it with you, and so she'll just jump right in, mm -hmm. because it is not abnormal for her, mm -hmm. because now she has mama, papa, and her kaikua ana, yeah. and her kaikua nane. She has all of them speaking, mm -hmm. so it, it it won't feel f harder to do. Or yeah. Forced. Or, yeah, not forced know, it at all. Doesn't feel artificial. Yeah. Um, so it's not a game, it's really, did I take the garbage out? Huakea, what would be your dream for the Hawaiian language, let's say 10, 20, 30 years from now? Really, I think anybody who lived here either understood it or spoke it. I mean, that's what I would, uh, to me, that would be healthy and beautiful, and all the people who did learn it and could speak it, you know, whether they spoke it or just simply understood it, I think their existence here would be richer. Right. Mm -hmm. They would be more engaged with what does happen. Hawaii uh -huh. is unique. That would help keep Hawaii unique. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I dream small like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul, if there was one word that you would like our viewers and listeners to learn, what would that word be? <laughs> one word. Just one yeah. word. Just one Hawaiian word. Oh. Uh. <laughs> it's hard to choose one word. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, hiapa i ole. Hiapa i ole. The desire, the desire to be the best that you can be. Never, never, never take second best. Hiapa i ole. What about you, Snowbird? You mean my, my one word? I know you, you give names to children. Uh, I know you've done that. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, <laughs> Ho'omau. 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 That we, um, that we continue. You know, we hear a lot about people saying, you know, at, in this year, 20 whatever law, um, Hawaiians, uh, full-blooded full Hawaiians will be no longer in existence. And I'm thinking that, in, and not to go into that debate about blood quantum, because it's a non-issue really, mm -hmm. uh, for me anyway. I cannot speak to everyone, but oh, cool. um, that we're, we're able to, I think of my tutu lady. I, I think about her decision to not allow her full-blooded children to speak Hawaiian. Because she thought, it's, I'm gonna protect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell them, no, no, you do this because this, it'll be better for you. You guys will be more successful. But in whose eyes? Mm -hmm. And then I think about my last times with her, and her only speaking to Hawaiian, you know, only speaking Hawaiian to me. She'd never spoken Hawaiian to any of her children, any of her grandchildren. She would tell them, no, you don't want to learn it. You don't, you, you don't, you don't want to do that. But then I come along, and she's speaking Hawaiian to me. What is that about? And so in my head, it that's whole mo. Mm -hmm. She came to a realization that if she didn't, then there would be no one left to know what our story is, what our mo'olelo is. And it's not just us as a, a lahui, as a, as a people, but ourselves as, as, as family, as ohana. Mm -hmm. Kalihua, what is that one word? Would you like uh, us luckily, to take away? Luckily, I had time. To <laughs> 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 well, I think uh, Hiapo he brought it up earlier and going through when I heard the word velo. Because I think the word velo um, looks at the inherited nature of what we carry. So um, we all, as Hawaiians, we feel separated sometimes from our from our um, two, three generations back. We feel separated from our language and culture because we've been bred and taught that way in schools, through textbooks, mm -hmm. through the way that we're, we we were uh, our our educational experiences. Where the truth really is that if we look at our people, if we look at our kupuna. We look at our makua. Our culture is thriving within them. Mm -hmm. we, just, mm -hmm. we just weren't ready to, to see it. Cool, cool. And I think with, with, that, with that cultural uh, awareness of, hey, that's me. Because I think, you know, and I, and I asked somebody, uh, one of the teachers um, I just was speaking with earlier, you know, wh why, do, why do we do what we do in Kaipuni? And, you know, this, the answer came, oh, eola ka olelo Hawaii. That the language live, that the language live. And really, I took, I, what I took away from that is that's, that's actually not what I'm about. You know, I, I'm that, um, that, that our people live, our people are successful. And Velo teaches me that 
in my genealogy, my kupuna were akamai, my kupuna were smart, and so I should be. And I need to embrace that. Um, and that, that, that's what gives me my sense of kuleana and, and teaches me what I do and how I need to walk through life. And quickly, Puakea, you get the last word. Yeah. What is your word? My word would be, I, I, and I'm a word baby, um, <laughs> mahalo. I mean, because if people really understood, it doesn't mean thank you at all. Mm -hmm. It means appreciation. In Hawaiian, you don't say thank you. Mm -hmm. You say, I am mahalo because of you. Mm -hmm. I am in a state of mahalo, of appreciation, admiration, you know, because of you. So you say, mahalo ya oi, mm -hmm. mahalo au ya oi. I'm, my condition is mahalo. Yeah. You're the cause. Mm -hmm. It comes across as thank you, but it's really, I'm appreciative because of you. And most people don't know that. And if they get a grip on that, it gives them a whole eye into right. the language. I think that's a window mm -hmm. into the way the language frames the world. But I love the, the notion you mentioned, the language is just part of the velo. Mm -hmm. So okay. those old traditions go on. Well, I'd like to thank you, Puakia, tonight, mm. Kalehua, Snowbird, and Hiapo. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, sport. Next time on Insights, despite efforts like opening shelters and closing parks at night, Hawaii still has the highest number of homeless residents per capita than any other state in the nation. The state legislature is considering measures to put more affordable units on the market, while the counties grapple with how to get the homeless out of tents and into shelters and more permanent housing. Next week on Insights, what more more can we do to solve our homelessness problem? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lani Richardson. Ahui ho.